Good evening and welcome to another Bible study with the Traverse City Church of Christ. We are going to talk about the subject of faith this evening. We'll be looking at uh, another aspect in this second part of our series. But before we do, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Father, with joy in our hearts and gratefulness for a life that you have given to us, uh, regardless of external circumstances, we have joy within knowing that you are with us. We thank you for the time that we have here. We pray that all things will go well and that hearts will consider the things talked about from your word. We pray for our nation and nations around the world that they might seek you for wisdom to know how to navigate through these trying times. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our series is that of faith, hope, and love. In our second part, we're going to continue looking at the subject of faith. And faith is a many-faceted aspect of the walk of uh, the Christian. Last week, we began by looking at Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Verses 1 and 2 of Hebrews 11 States, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. We went back to the last part of Hebrews chapter 10. It says, For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. So we see here that a statement made here in Hebrews chapter 10 is one that is taken from the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. My righteous one shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. And it's been stated by Paul in his letters. The righteous shall live by faith. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3, we looked at by faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. We continued on down to verse 6. It says, Without faith it is impossible to please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. So as we looked at, really the foundations of faith, to believe that there is a God, and that God created all that is in this world. We must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who seek Him, who, so that we have a hope of a reason to why we believe in Him. But there is there more? As we looked at uh, faith, that there is a God. Okay. Next, we looked at uh, Hebrews 11 for faith that sustained people. And the list that went on for the writer of the book of Hebrews that that began really at the early part of Genesis, continued on down through Genesis, and really worked through the Old Testament and told us about great people of faith, a faith that they had that sustained them, that gave them a hope to live in, something to look forward to. This week we'll look at another facet of faith as the faith required for salvation. Romans Chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul begins his introduction to the, his letter of Romans, a great letter. He writes in verse 5, Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about obedience of faith. So, so we have three things that are going on in it. We have grace, that unmerited favor. We have obedience of faith, obeying faith for the sake of his name among all nations. We continue on down to the end of the chapter in Romans 16, 26. He says, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. So there must be, with this faith, there must be, as Paul writes, an obedience to faith, not merely the assent of the mind. James writes that even the devils believe so it has to be more than just the ascent of the mind, more than just the recognition that there is a higher power. Because 
or so it's been said, of the world believes that there is a higher power, that there is a God. Now, they t may take the form of idols that they fashion out of wood or stone or metal or those things of the stars or uh, trees, uh, inanimate objects, but they believe that there is a higher power. But there must be something more than simply believing that there is a God. So we move into the aspect of salvation here. Faith is from the Greek word pistis. It means persuasion, that is credence, a moral conviction of religious truth or truthfulness of God or a religious teacher, especially the reliance upon Christ for salvation. Abstractly, constancy in such profession. By extension, the system of religious, the gospel truth itself, assurance, belief, believe, faith, and fidelity. Well, that's a great definition, so we understand the construct of it, but what is the reality of it? What does it look like? Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So what exactly is the faith God is looking for in us and requires of us? That's what we're going to ask. Is it simply to believe, or is there something more? Well, as in all things of a spiritual nature, the Bible being the true guide for us, we ask, what does the Bible say? Many will point to John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is a good place to begin with, for we have, uh, we talk about those who believe. Well, the word believes, or belief, is really from that same word, pistis, only in this term is pistugo. To have faith in, upon, or with respect to a person or a thing that is a credit by implication to entrust, especially one's spiritual well-being to Christ. To believe, to commit to, or to trust, or put trust with. And again, we, we have a good definition. So as we build upon these definitions, the next one is obedience. And we see apukae, which is the Greek word for obedience. Attentive hearkening, that is, by implication, compliance or submission, obedient, to obey. So we look at faith and belief, which come from the same word, but now we have obedience. And so we'll use this combination, which Paul used in Romans chapter 1 and verse 5, obedience and faith in obedience as they are combined together. We look at some things from the Old Testament and from the Bible in general. In Joshua chapter 6, we find that the Israelites have crossed the Jordan. They've come upon the town city of Jericho, and they are given this command by God, beginning in verse 2. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and its mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus you shall do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall bow the trumpets. So we look at this. This is a command that God has given to the Israelites. What if the Israelites had not obeyed the Lord completely? Would the walls of Jericho have fallen? Well, fortunately for the Israelites, they obeyed God's every command. They marched around it once a day for six days. On the seventh day they marched around seven times, just as they were commanded. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 9-12, through 12, we find that we have a man named Naaman, and Naaman was a commander of the Babylonian army. And Naaman, we are told earlier in this chapter, had leprosy. According to one of his servants, who was uh, uh, a, uh, an Israelite slave that they had taken, she says, there is a man in Israel who can cure this. 
So Naaman goes to Israel to find the cure. So we begin the account in verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Continuing on, but his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So once again we ask the question, would Naaman have been cleansed had he not obeyed completely every command? What if he had dipped and went to the Jabbok River, which is a tributary of the uh, Jordan River? It comes in from the east side. What if he had gone to the Jabbok River or to the Sea of Galilee and dipped seven times in there? How about if he dipped only one time? Two times? Three or four or only six times? Would he have been cleansed? I believe in this case, as in the case of the walls falling in Jericho, they would not have because they have not obeyed the Lord's command. Now, how can we make a statement like this? Well, let's go back a little bit further into the Old Testament. In Numbers chapter 20, verses 7, 7 through 10, we find that the the assembly of the congregation of Israel has murmured again to Moses because of the lack of water. We pick up the story in verse 10 of Numbers chapter 20. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with the staff twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank in their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given you. But Moses did believe he could get water from the rock. He just did it his way. Why didn't God accept it? That's the question that we ask. Why didn't God accept this? God told Moses to speak to the rock, but Moses struck the rock. The water came out, but the consequences were that neither Moses nor Aaron would lead the people into the promised land. So we find that God has made requests. He has made commands of people to do things. He expects them to be done His way. Now we go to Leviticus chapter 10, and verses 1 through 3. We find that Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, and Aaron being the high priest and his sons being priests under him, uh, they are commanded to do certain things. In verse 1 of Leviticus chapter 10, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said, Among those who are near me I will be sanctified, and before all people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. We find that Nadab and Abihu offered what is called unauthorized fire. Whatever this was, we aren't told specifically, but we do have a commandment that God had given them. In Exodus chapter 30, verses 7 through 9, And Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it. Every morning when he dresses the lamps, he shall burn it. And when Aaron sets up the lamps at twilight, he shall burn it. At regular incense offering before the Lord throughout your generations, you shall not offer unauthorized incense on it, or a burnt offering, or a grain offering, and you shall not pour a drink offering on it. So God was very specific about what they can and shall not offer for this. 
and Nadab and Abihu disobeyed that commandment of God and paid a very severe price for it. Why did God punish Nadab and Abihu? After all, they did offer incense to the Lord. In Genesis chapter 4 and verses 3 through 5, we read, In the course of time Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of the fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. So we have here the beginning of the description of the offerings that were brought, the sacrifices. Now, Cain offers the fruit of the ground, which talking about grain, whatever it might have been, and Abel brings the firstborn of his flock, animal sacrifices. Now, each of those were given, but the Lord only had regard for Abel and his offering. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4 says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. And this faith, we find, is the obedience to whatever he was told. He must have known, both of them must have known what was going to be an acceptable offering. However, Cain did not offer an acceptable offering, even though we can assume that he knew what it was. Abel knew, and by faith he offers that acceptable gift. So what does it mean by faith? Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice. Well, and what more shall we add? Well, what if Noah had used a different wood, or different dimensions, or a different design when he built the ark? What if Moses had decided not to build the tabernacle and its first furnishings according to the design? Exodus 25, verse 9 and verse 40 both say that he was given specific uh, instructions on this. Acts 7:44 and Hebrews 8, 5 says that he was, a, he was to build it according to the pattern that he was shown. But what if he chose not to? Well, by faith, they did these exactly as they were commanded. So faith and belief, being the same thing, must be accompanied by obedience. But is this still true in the Christian age? We've looked at Cain and Abel being in what we would call the patriarchal age, in which the head of families were to offer sacrifices for the family. We went on into the Mosaic age, in which the law guided people. So we see that God made commands and expected them to be fulfilled. And there was a punishment that happened as a result of that. But is that still true in the Christian age? Is God somehow different? Does He somehow expect less of us when He makes a command for us? Let's take a look and see. Faith must be accompanied by obedience. Uh, so we look at John chapter 4, verses 23 through 24. Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well. She is a Samaritan. She is surprised because Jesus, being a Jew, is talking at the very least to a woman and then to a Samaritan. Jesus explains to her, the hour is coming, it's coming, it's in the future yet, and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. So God expects the same thing in these days that He has expected all along. We may remember that the Hebrew writer said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is the same. He expects that His commands are followed in spirit and in truth. In spirit, we might say reasonably, is from the heart with heartfelt conviction. And truth means the way God commands. So we can use that as our guidance. In Colossians chapter 2, in verses 20 through 23, Paul, speaking to the church at Colossae, is going to make a reference to what is acceptable worship, uh, acceptable ways uh, of life. If with Christ you die to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have an indeed 
a, an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Some of the older versions, instead of saying promoting self-made religion, have, uh, uh, have will religion. Uh, so it's, it's talking about what man has designed for himself, will worship as they call it. Uh, so if God has commanded us to do something, then we can come to the conclusion that he expects, it to do it, expects us to do it his way. How does this re uh, relate to salvation? Has God given us commands as, uh, according to salvation? Has he given us commands to do as it pertains to worship? Has God given us commands as it pertains to daily living? Are we simply left on our own? We say, well, I, I have a good feeling about how I should be saved and how I should worship God or how I should live my life according to how I think it ought to be, apart from what the Word of God tells us. No, He expects us to do it His way. As, we, as it pertains to salvation, Jesus began, or should we say ended, his life before his ascension into heaven concerning salvation in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Many people will often call this the, uh, the Great Commission. This is what he has committed or made the commission for his disciples to go. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So we stop right there and say, Well, if all authority has been given in heaven and on earth, then what Jesus says is with authority and should be done. So he gives them, and I, I have... Uh, really uh, four different commands that he has is go therefore and make disciples go and make disciples of all nations so the first command is to go but not just to go out but also to make disciples baptizing them in the name of the father and the son of the holy spirit so we find this is part of the plan of salvation and then teaching them to observe a little bit of what is he's, he's commanded some of what he's commanded or all that he has commanded. Well, we can see right here, it says, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Now, Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And we come down to Luke chapter 24, verses 46 through 48. All of these have been given before Jesus makes his ascension and rises back up to heaven. And he said to them, beginning in verse 46, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So we can see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that they are given orders to do. So we... And they are, these are not opposed to one another. He says that they are to go out and they are to proclaim or to preach, to go into all the world, to all nations. And these are the things that they should talk about. They're going to talk about repentance for forgiveness of sins. They're going to talk about baptism. And they're going to talk about those who believe. Did the apostles obey the command of the Lord to go and proclaim or to preach the message of salvation? They were given this command by Jesus. Let's see if they actually did it. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 14, uh, a matter of about uh, 10 days or so after Jesus had ascended, we find on the day of Pentecost, but Peter, at, when they had, uh, the people had come together because they're hearing them speak each in their own language, then we find, but Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. And this is what we call preaching. He's proclaiming, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. He's calling their attention. And then he continues on for what we might see for the next uh, two dozen verses or so, telling about the things that have been prophesied from the Old Testament. And you can read this on your own, but the, uh, the gist of the, what I'm trying to uh, show here is that Peter actually did what the Lord had told him. He's going to preach. He's going to preach to them uh, about his death, burial, and resurrection. And so we come down at the end, and at the end of a sermon, in verse 36, he says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, speaking of Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? We can tell that they believed what Peter told them, and that they 
uh, have a certain regret, a repentance, uh, as it were, of the, uh, the idea that they need to do something. Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we have, uh, really, it's already apparent that they believe, but he tells them they must repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. So we see that they actually did do what Christ had told them to do. Peter preaches the gospel. Uh, the gospel is that Jesus came to offer himself as a sacrifice for sins in the scriptures. And he, he points it out that Jesus offered himself. He died, was buried, and was raised again uh, out of the grave to overcome death. When Peter was asked what they should do, he tells them exactly what Jesus commanded. Repentance for forgiveness of sins was preached, Luke 24, 47. Baptism in his name, Matthew 28, 19. And for those who believe, baptism, Mark 16, 16. So we see that he indeed did fulfill exactly what Christ had commanded them to do. And as we continue through the book of Acts, which gives the accounts of the growth of the church in the years following Jesus' resurrection and ascension into heaven and the command to go into the world, what do we find happening? Did they go preach? Yes. We find in Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, But when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Here is uh, Philip preaching in Samaria. Uh, we find that Philip goes out. And Philip op opened his mouth and beginning with the scriptures and told him the good news about Jesus. And he's speaking to the Ethiopian eunuch who had been commanded to go and preach on the road to Gaza. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and both went down to the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he was baptized. Verse 37 actually says, If you believe with all your heart, you may. Okay. So we see this chart here uh, of the examples. And it, rather than go through each one individually, we can see in this chart in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 9, chapter 10, verse 16, uh, chapter 16, chapter 18, chapter 19, uh, all of these. And we look at the steps of believing, of repenting, confessing, being baptized, and as a result, we find the salvation. And this chart shows that the book of Acts uh, follows through and indeed shows everything that they were commanded to teach. Now we have the, the idea of, of here on, uh, on the left and right of your screen, we have what uh, on the right was just called the sinner's prayer. And this is something that is relatively recent in history, has come about since the Reformation. And the sinner's prayer goes something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. God, I believe that you died for my sins and you rose from the dead. I'm asking you to come into my heart and my life. I am trusting you and will follow you all the days of my life. From this day forward, I will follow you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. And this seems like a, uh, a pretty straightforward uh, idea of what salvation is about. And on the left-hand side, it gives you those steps. Number one, I have sinned. God loves me. Christ died for me. I receive him. I have, I have everlasting life. Is there a basis in Scripture for these? Well, let's look at, at another uh, God's five-step plan. And beginning down at the bottom, we see that uh, one must hear, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Believing. Uh, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever should believe shall have eternal life. Acts 17, 30, Paul tells those in Athens that, uh, it's time for all men to repent. Romans 10.10 10 says, With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then Mark 16.15 and Acts 2.38, we find that they were baptized. All of these we can find in Scripture. But do we find this? Do we actually find anyone saying the sinner's prayer? Well, they may go back to the Old Testament, but we don't live under the Old Testament. We don't live under the old law. We live under the law of Christ. Remember, Jesus said that all authority has been given to me, and therefore he gave them commands of what to do. Is the sinner's prayer part of what Jesus commanded people to do? Can you find it in the scriptures? 
Well, Romans 10, verse 17, we say, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Now, remember last week we looked at the writer of the book of Hebrews talks about that uh, what faith is, a faith in believing that there is a God and that He is a rewarder of those who come to Him. Uh, so we read many things about faith, about believing that God created this world. It just didn't come into being on its own. But we find as it pertains to salvation, the faith resulting in salvation, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. We can't hear it from, say, the Bhagavad Gita or the Talmud uh, or other writings that, that do not pertain to Christianity. We must go to the words of Christ to find out. Faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the Word of Christ. Paul tells the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4, it's about as concise of the gospel message. He tells them, For I deliver to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He really... Uh, uh, puts it, encapsulate it, really in these two verses. The first importance, what I received, Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. He was buried, and He was raised on the third day. In Acts 2.41, he says, So those who received His word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. There's a connection here between receiving the word, which really is means they believe the word, they were baptized and they were added, about 3,000 souls. And that's the day of Pentecost, which Peter preached. Acts chapter 80, verse 36 uh, through 37. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answers and says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And it tells us that they went down in the water and were baptized. So I stop here for just a moment. How would the Ethiopian eunuch have known that baptism was a part of salvation unless Philip had told him? How would he even have known? And if it was simply with sprinkling, if they are on their road back to Ethiopia, surely they had containers of water. If it was by sprinkling or dipping, surely they would have used that. But Philip has explained to him that baptism is by immersion. That's why he says, see, here's water. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Jesus talked of this in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 through 33. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So we see that in Romans 10, 9 through 10, it's not just believing, he says, but it's also with the mouth confession is made unto, on the way to salvation. But it's not yet. Luke chapter 24, verse 47, we've read this earlier, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Uh, in Acts chapter 17, verse 30, we looked at this previously, True to the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts 3.19, uh, Peter tells them, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So, it's more than simply believing. It's more than simply believing and confessing. But now we have believing, confessing, and we're told that repentance is also a part of this process. In Mark 16, 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. It's really almost the same wordage that Jesus says about those who confess. He'll confess him before his Father, but whoever does not confess. Okay? Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What were some of those things that they would command them to observe? Well, certainly it has to be 
about the teachings of salvation, to observe all things that I have commanded you. What did he just command them? He commanded them to go, make disciples, and to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So those who would say that baptism is not needed or is not required for salvation have clearly gone against the commands that Jesus himself, who has all authority, commanded. So I can read each step of salvation in the Bible. I can read about hearing. I know it must be preached. I can read about believing. I can read about repenting. I can read, I can read about confession. And I can read about being baptized. But I have never read the sinner's prayer. And I have not seen one example of the sinner's prayer in Scripture. Now, which do you believe? The Bible or the traditions of man? And remember, that's exactly what Paul talked about to the church at Colossae, teaching for the traditions of men. So we see the examples once again in a similar chart about preaching, and preaching was always done, and to the extent that people believed, not everyone believed, but for those who believe, we find there were cases where it specifically said they repented. We find examples of confession. We find that in nearly all, they specifically talk about being baptized. And it talks about being saved. All of those things coming together. Many times people will point to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, His one and only Son. That whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. But in this same teaching by Jesus to Nicodemus, this is what he says just prior to that in verses 3 through 5. Jesus answered, said to him, speaking to Nicodemus, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Was water required for salvation? According to what Jesus, and he remember, he has all authority. He says, yes, one is born of, bar, born of the water and the Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. Is water baptism required for salvation? Jesus says so right here in the same conversation, in the same context, when he said, whoever believes. Acts 2.32, what did Peter say when they said, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We come back to here, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit. Peter says, be baptized, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Which will you believe? The traditions of man or will you believe what the Scripture actually says? For Jesus says it will be by His words that we will be judged. So as we come to the end of our uh, class today, as we have looked at faith as it pertains to salvation, we want you to, to read and study these for yourself, to come to that conclusion by what the Bible says. So when you hear someone that says, all I want you to do, all you need to do, all you're ever required to do is to say the sinner's prayer and you cannot be lost, remember, it is by the words of Christ that we will be judged. Last week we looked at faith as it pertains to believing that there is a God and that faith which led those people of the old to have that type of faith that led them to have a hope. This week we looked at Faith as it pertains to salvation. Next week, we're going to look at faith as it pertains to how we live and how we worship God. And God, believe it or not, has some very specific commands as to how we should worship Him. So as we close, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Father, we thank You for a time that we have spent here. We never tire of giving thanks to You or being appreciative or for being grateful for all that you have given to us. We pray that as we have looked at your word to see what you have commanded of what faith truly is, that we will be led to do and obey what you have commanded us to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.